Hi everyone, just a quick video for some Maldoc analysis. I was looking at my Twitter feed this morning and came across a post from AnyRun and that they had observed some abnormal behavior in an Emotet office document, a Maldoc, and thought I'd go ahead and, and just do a little investigation to see what was there. Now, this is a change from what we've seen for most, uh, probably the better part of 2020, and that uh, for the most part with these Emotet office docs, they are Word documents, they contain macros. Um, those macros, really the, the main purpose of the macros is to decode a base 64 encoded payload. Um, typically there's there's little patterns, little string patterns inside that base 64 that get pulled out, they get replaced, and that then provides a base 64 string that is executed via PowerShell. And so we can see that here in this example from uh, another document from today. We can actually uh, decode that quite quickly, especially with dynamic analysis. It's also you know, relatively straightforward to do it statically, although you have to figure out what the, the token or that pattern is that they're replacing on. But here we can grab the, uh, the PowerShell process and you can see there is the actual base64 payload. Now with PowerShell, uh, what we can pro if you provide the dash ENCO argument or, or command line option, um, then that tells PowerShell that this is base64. So go ahead and decode it and then execute that. If we go to a tool like CyberChef to do the decoding, I've already got the recipe created uh, from base64 and then decode text. And the reason that we need to decode the text is that um, once this decoded, is, it is UTF-16. So this then will give us nice ASCII output. If we were to not have that, we would just have the extra characters which are, are represented here by the dots. So each character being multi-byte, two bytes, and not needing that extra byte. Um, you can see here, uh, PowerShell, very straightforward PowerShell, uh, .NET Web Client. It'll iterate through a list of hosts that are hosting the Trojan, so the XE, the payload. Um, once it is able to obtain one, it writes it to the file system and executes it. So um, that's really the, the pattern with the, you know, the majority of the Emotet Maldocs that we've seen this year. Okay, so what about the change? Uh, well, as the original post mentioned, it was using CertUtil to decode the payload and then run the Trojan. And, and we can see that now in the process activity. Uh, begins, of course, with our office document, WinWord. But now we have CertUtil being called with the decode argument. So that's taking an input, the uh, file ksh1.xls, which in this particular instance was written to C users public, and then an output file, which is the .pdf. Uh, so see users public ksh1.pdf. That PDF then becomes input for run DLL32, and in is our entry point. So when, when calling a DLL, we have to specify the entry point. It's really the main difference between that and just using an exe, an executable. Uh, run DLL launches, eventually we see the unpacking and our Emotet Trojan shows up, as well as the associated network traffic and the IDS alerts that go along with that. So what uh, what we can do next then is actually just take a look and do a little bit of analysis on the document itself. So we can download this since it was a public submission. Uh, I've already done that uh, and I've dropped and ex or extracted that document from the password protected zip. Uh, pretty common to when you download those um, those artifacts from different places that it'll be password protected zip file with a password of infected. So here's our document. Uh, we can now go to a terminal and go ahead and, and do a little bit of analysis here. Uh, I like to start with OLE dump and we'll use OLE dump and our input file contract 6588.doc. Um, OLE dump will show us if we have macros. So here on stream eight, we can see that we have macros. Uh, we have to suspect that there is a large base 64 encoded payload because in this case, it appears that the, the DLL is actually embedded in the file instead of being retrieved from a, you know, a compromised host as we saw with the PowerShell. So uh, this column here gives us the size of the stream and it looks like we have a fairly large stream here. So I, I would suspect that that's certainly where our base64 payload is. Now, uh, with this document, we can also go ahead and just run strings on it. If we give it a dash n argument, we can help to filter out our string results by um, only showing strings that are larger than a specific size. So big base64 payload, I would expect it to be quite large. Um, and then we need, of course, our input file. And if we run that, we'll see uh, definitely output here that would appear to be our base64 payload. And while that, again, is not terribly new, uh, the fact that, one, it's not obfuscated right now. We don't see little patterns in here um, to help defeat 
or to just make it more difficult to automatically extract this, uh, that's one. The other is that this is the, the DLL. So what we can do, uh, if we want to just continue with some, some static analysis, is we can just go ahead and grab that, and I'm going to redirect that output to a file, B64. I'm going to open this up with code, and just to make sure that there are no leading um, characters that I don't need, uh, as you can see here, there there is some 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 text here, some arbitrary text. So it looks like we'd be able to uh, delete that from you know all the way up to this this first capital letter. We already looked at the trailing portion of that. Uh, we'll just double check it again, and I'll just sort of sort of eyeball uh, this payload here as we go. Uh, I don't see anything that is, you know, requires a uh, any more filtering or extraction. So looks like we're good. Save the file, um, and now what we can do is we can cat our B64 file, and we can pipe it to, um, excuse me, base64 uh, dash d. Uh, looks like we got some binary content there. Um, so we don't want that out at the terminal. We want to actually redirect that then to another file. So we'll just call this payload.bin. And now we can run file on our payload.bin. We can see, in fact, we do have a PE file, uh, and it is, of course, a DLL. So from here, we can grab a file hash and possibly go search for this on other you know, threat research utilities or sources that, uh, are, that you favor or prefer. Uh, for example, we could go to virus total. We'll just go to the virus total homepage. We'll search for this hash. And we'll see that at the time of this recording, uh, fairly low detections, 13 out of 70. Um, not terribly clear as to what it is uh, based off of these AV labels, and there's no community uh, response quite yet. Uh, we can also go back to where we originally got the sample. Uh, so we can go to any run. Again, paste in that hash and see if we get some analysis. Uh, looks like we did, uh, but in this case, no threats were detected. So that's uh, that's actually kind of interesting. Okay, so we not, we got no results here, or at least we have nothing to help us identify this rather quickly. We don't have any tags that have been applied through any dot run or any runs um, analysis. Uh, we don't have, it looks like we don't have any connections, at least no connections that, um, again, generated any IDS alerts or anything to help us to help us quickly identify that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I, I usually try several different sources. So we'll try uh, hatching triage. Uh, we can go to the public reports. We can do a search and again, type in our hash and we can see that there we go. We have a couple of DLLs, uh, one that matches our file naming. That's because I actually uploaded it earlier. And then one that matches from any run. We can see the tags for Emotet, Epoch 3. And so it does in fact match up with what any run had originally reported in that original tweet. Okay, well, um, that was, you know, again, fairly straightforward, but we can also get into the, the document a little bit more, into the macros, because sometimes the ability to extract those IOCs, to extract those those key payloads isn't quite as straightforward. So uh, if we go back to OLE dump, we can identify the stream index that our macros are in, uh, stream 8. And we can use OLE dump to extract those, so dash S8 and then dash V to decode. Here you'll see we have the contents of our macro stream. Um, not always the easiest place to analyze those in the terminal, so I'll just go ahead and we'll open this up in Visual Studio Code. And one of the main reasons I like to do that is I can simply change the syntax highlighting to Visual Basic. And it just makes it a little bit easier to clear that um, visual or to, to, to kind of process this visually. Um, you'll notice that uh, in the macro stream here, Really, not a whole lot going on. Um, this is a, a document close, so one of uh, another small changes. Uh, typically, macros in the more prevalent form of the Emotet droppers are to use document open. So this waits until the document closes. Then it calls form close. Uh, form close then goes through and creates a series of objects before it looks like it's writing um, a couple of documents or a couple of artifacts anyway to the file system, XLS and doc. Um, and then it does the set task, in which case uh, we have all of the additional functions right here to help us. Um, as is very common with obfuscation in Visual Basic, Visual, VBA Visual Basic for applications and macros, the strings are hidden somewhere in the document, uh, typically in user form objects such as text boxes and labels, but it can also be in the, the content of the document itself. So when we look at uh, some of these functions here, 
we will notice if we trace into where this function is defined, you'll notice that it takes two arguments, two numeric values. Um, so this first instance, button click two, two comma 16, those are the two arguments. And then it is using those to help identify content within the active document, the, the paragraphs. And so if we go back to our um, output here from running OLE dump, you'll notice that this stream has a fairly significant size. So this is likely where all of our content is located and, and we're seeing that now in the macros uh, and that it's looking at that active document and, and kind of slicing and dicing these paragraphs to get that content out. Um, you'll notice the set task that's going to call this set task function, which uses whatever this MS13 object. So this create object call, um, it's going to use that to create and, and call whatever that task is. And in between, these two tasks that are being executed, it's going to sleep for six seconds and then and then call the second. So here we have uh, the set task with .xls and .pdf. And if we just think about this and going back to the original report from any run and, and looking at that behavioral, uh, no, that's not the right one. Sorry about that. Wrong tab. And looking at the behavioral, we can see that while well, certutil takes two arguments for to, to decode, it decodes an input file, so that's our .xls, and then it provides an output file, which is our .pdf. So um, if I had to guess, I would say that this is the certutil task, and then it sleeps, and then this task, because it's using .pdf and in, is going to be, going back to our dynamic analysis, this is going to be the call to run DLL32. So um, certainly it looks like that is the, the case. Uh, in order to figure that out, we could continue to do a little static analysis here. We do have the ability, as, as you saw earlier, um, to run strings on this document. We could do maybe look for grep for cert util. Um, there it is, cert util dash decode. Okay, but where does this content actually live then? Um, in order to analyze the document, I will oftentimes just use Office itself. Um, it's an easy way to open the document, investigate the content. We also have the benefit of using the built-in developer suite of tools, the IDE, the Integrated Development Environment, which becomes very handy if we wanna do any sort of debugging. Uh, but for right now, uh, we can just look at the content of the document. You'll notice that there are two pages, which to me typically means that there is, is, is you know, it, it, hidden content here. And if we just go ahead and, and, you know, I might select all. So I did a control A. You can see quite a bit of things were highlighted. Um, I'm going to get rid of this image. We'll do a control A again. Then going to home, uh, we will change the font to something that is not white. We can see there is a lot of content there. It looks like it has a font size of one, so we can increase that. And now we'll see there are our strings. So C users public, which was part of the path where those artifacts were dropped and written to. Um, we have this win MGMTS, win32 process, so how processes started. There's run DLL, there's cert util, and eventually we also get to uh, the rest of the document, which is that DLL that we already extracted. So that's where all of this content is actually created. Um, as I said, we have the ability to run through the program or the, the macros using the developer. Uh, the developer tools, uh, one thing to keep in mind when doing this is that you have to, of course, enable the content, enable the macro. So you're going to run those macros before you can get in and actually debug those. So just make sure if you choose to do that, you're in a safe sandboxed environment. Once we decide, though, we can open up that developer tab. So here is our developer tab. Go to Visual Basic, and then we can expand where that stream, those macros are located. And now we just want to pick a... Um, one of the functions that is close to where this all begins. So we can maybe set a breakpoint on document close or set it on form close. We just want to make sure, like setting a breakpoint when doing any debugging, that the execution will get there. Um, in this case, I want to just go ahead and set it right here because I just want to show you where these, uh, where this content is written. So once our breakpoint is set, we can select play you'll see when your breakpoint is encountered and that you'll get this yellow arrow. Uh, now we have the tools here for the debugger. Uh, those are not oddly enough open by default. So you have to go to view toolbars and then select debug. And then I just drop it or, or dock it up here. 
And now we can step in, step over, step out. So typical debugger things as well as stop and resume. So here we have a call to save as three. If we step into that, the power of being able to debug is instead of having to figure out exactly what it's going to or where it's going to save it, we can just inspect those variables. So you can see that it's going to do a save as to uh, the file name. And there's our file name, which is actually set up above here. And it's appending on the extension. So that's the argument which we already sus suspected from the dynamic analysis that we looked at earlier. So a .xls and a .doc. So after those two save as calls are completed, what we should find is the doc, the PDF, um, and the XLS. Well, actually, we should have only seen the doc and the XLS. I clicked continue to debug one too many times, and that then ran that first cert util. So what are the doc and the XLS? Uh, well, if you open those with a hex editor, you'll see that those are, that's our base 64 payload. A little hard to see here, but that is our base 64 payload. And both, both of those artifacts, both of these files are, are in fact that. So there's the XLS, there's the doc, and of course we could trace the macro code to see that it wrote the same content to each, to each file here. Um, because we stepped, or I stepped one too many times, well, at least one more than I was expecting, uh, that first call to set task was to go ahead and do the cert util dash decode. So hovering over one, that variable one, we can see that. We could also right click and add a watch. That way we can have that variable down here in a watch window. And certainly we could detach this if you want it somewhere else. Uh, but now we can see there's our cert util, uh, there's the PDF. And there we can see then the PE file after it's been decoded as, as we would expect. Um, we could also, because we have these artifacts and we know that they're just base64 encoded content, we could open these up as well. Uh, we could copy this content out. We could base64 decode it. So again, there's a lot of ways in which we could analyze this. Um, again, this is then, if we go back to the macros, uh, we see a, a short sleep call and then set task two. So we can go ahead and just confirm. But we already know that uh, based off our analysis and everything we've seen that this is our call to run DLL32. So if we just highlight or hover over the first variable two, which we expect to be run DLL32, there of course it is. Uh, we already know STP to be the path in the beginning of the file name. There's the .pdf extension, and then there is the, um, the entry point. So the exported function that will be called. And so from there, if we go back to original analysis, uh, we'll see the unpacking and eventually the emotet trojan make its appearance. So anyways, a uh, slight change in, in tactics. It's interesting to see if maybe there are more changes uh, coming on the horizon. Um, so certainly appreciate anyone posting this and hope you enjoyed this brief analysis.